Why would I wear fake glasses? Tell me, because everyone just assumes that they're fake. Why would I wear fake glasses? Why would you just not go wear real ones? Because maybe I ran out of contacts. Well, now we know you ran out of contacts. <laughs> oh, kiddo. Oh, right. so, uh, yeah. so, 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 and to read chapter five, and I think if we get started right now, you will only have two or three paragraphs to read for homework. Because if I give you homework, guess what you're going to get tomorrow? A little quiz. <laughs> oh, always. Yay. So it's in your best interest for us to get going. I know you band will miss tomorrow. So what oh, that means for the pep me. rally, listen, track the speaker over here. What that means is that you will need to request for the reading of chapter six tomorrow because it is a good and important chapter. Oh, very pretty hills over there that I finally caved sixth period and thought no, no more. I couldn't take it anymore. All right. So let's get on with page 27 is where we are. Are there any other questions that are really important that you need to ask? Really important. Noah, lean forward. I'm not going to listen to a question from somebody leaning back like you're in a lazy boy recliner. There you go. Um, can you send me the ones you If you put it in writing, yes, because I'm not stopping. I just can't remember. I don't have a good memory for stuff like that. Amaya? I hear responsibly for not my Oh, thank you for being honest. Come quietly and borrow. But um, we do not throw stones, Miss Baker. Oh, I just. Um, <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, dear Amaya. Now, you haven't completely lost your book, have you? No, ma'am. All right. You ready? Page 27. Did we undermine a wild looking woman? Yeah. Red yeah. hair and all that? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Where's Paul? I afraid they think this must be a man, was Mr. Morris's uh, breathless reflection, uh, simultaneously with his coming against for Walter. Did what? we read that part yesterday? Yes. 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 And so you already had to ask for foreshadowing in prodigious yes. strength? Yes, yes. What? Wait, prodigious strength. That's what it's foreshadowing. Oh, good deal. Oh, right. Why, look at you all! Called this figure addressing the inn servants. Why don't you go and fetch things instead of standing there staring at me? I am not so much a look at life. Why don't you go and fetch things? I'll let you know if you don't bring smelling salts, cold water, and vinegar. Wait, I will. There was an immediate dispersal for these restorations, and she softly laid the patient on the sofa, and tended her with great skill and gentleness, calling her my precious and my bird, and spreading her golden hair aside over her shoulders with great pride and care. And you in brown, she said, indignantly turning to Mr. Lawrence. Brown. Couldn't you tell her what you had to tell her without frightening her to death? Look at her with her pretty pale face and her cold hands. Do you call that being a banker? Mr. Lorry was so exceedingly disconcerted by a question so hard to answer that he could only look on at a distance with much feebler sympathy and humility, while the strong woman, having banished the inn servants under the mysterious penalty of letting them know something not mentioned if they stayed there staring, recovered her charge by a regular series of gradations and coaxed her to lay her drooping head upon her shoulder. I hope she will do well now said Mr. Lorry. Brown, if she does, my darling pretty. I hope, 
said Mr. Lorry, after another pause of feeble sympathy and humility, that you accompany Miss Manette to France. A likely thing, too, replied the strong woman. If it was ever intended that I should go across salt water, do you suppose Providence would have cast my lot in an island? This being another question hard to answer, Mr. Jarvis Lorry withdrew to consider it. Now take your green pin. Chapter and underneath five. chapter five, the wine shop. I want you to write in France. This is the first chapter that takes place in France. And we're writing in France under the title, The Wine Shop. I want you to know that. Okay, now you will notice an absence of red on this page and on the first part of this page. That's because you are going to be figuring out what to underline in red. Yes, you can do it. No, because here's your, here are your instructions. Not in the first paragraph, I wouldn't worry about that little bitty paragraph, but in the next two paragraphs for sure. You're looking for words, specific words, and you cannot underline more than three words that are connected. So you're looking for one word, two word, three word combinations throughout those two paragraphs that convey a tone of menace. Do we know what menace is? What about if someone gives you a menacing look? Evil. What about if you've ever heard the phrase, ooh, he's a menace to society? Okay? So a menace then, we could think of something that causes evil, harm, or injury. Okay? And so a good synonym of menace would be threat. So like we could think of air pollution as being a menace to our environment, right? Okay, so you're just underlining the most words you can underline connected are three, but you can do it. I have faith in you. So here's what's going on in the first paragraph. This is telling us that in the, in the streets of Paris, there's this large cask of wine, barrel of wine, and it's going to fall off the back of a wagon and it's going to shatter or burst open. And when that happens, all of these desperately poor, starving people are going to rush. They're going to be jostling each other out of the way because they're trying to scoop up any bit of this wine for themselves and for their children, even their babies. Why? They're not trying to get their babies drunk, but the wine has calories, unlike all the stuff, you know, just water. It's so much better than water for them. So that's what's going on, and you're going to undermine, starting in the second paragraph, words that convey a tone of myth. Here we go. A large cask of wine had been dropped and broken in the street. The accident had happened in getting it out of the car. The cask had tumbled out with a run, the hoops had burst, and it lay on the stones just outside the door of the wine shop, shattered like a walnut shell. All the people within reach had suspended their business or their idleness to run to the spot and drink the wine. The rough, irregular stones of the street pointing every way and designed, one might have thought, expressly to lame all living creatures that approached them, had dammed it into little pools. These were surrounded, each by its own jostling group or crowd, according to its size. Some men kneeled down, made scoops of their two hands joined, and sipped, or tried to help women who bent over their shoulders to sip, before the wine had all run out between their fingers. Others, men and women, dipped in the puddles with little mugs of mutilated earthenware. Cheeks from women's heads, which were squeezed dry into infants' mouths. Others made small mud embankments to stem the wine as it ran. Others, directed by lookers-on up at high windows, darted here and there to cut off little streams of wine that started away in new directions. 
Others devoted themselves to the sodden and lead-eyed pieces of the cask, licking and even champing the moister wine-rotted fragments with eager relish. Pitched to carry off the wine. And not only did it all get taken up, but so much mud got taken up along with it that there might have been a scavenger in the street, if anybody acquainted with it could have believed in such a miraculous presence. Time out. Who thinks they found something that might convey a tone of menace? Ray Amaya. Is your book already marked? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't call on you. I'll just pick on people. Cyrus. That's a good one. Lame all, let's say lame all creatures. How about that? Because we're talking about the road. The road is not nice like our road. It's just made up of rocks and stones. And these rocks and stones are jaggedy and pointy it's not flat or smooth at all and so it's almost like the roads are designed to cripple people for life that's why he said lame all creatures and so that you would know what is laming all creatures how could we say rough stones would that help if you undermine rough stones so that you would know that that's what's laming all creatures Give me something else. There's so many things in here that you could come up with. Timmy, try. Just try. We've all said dumb things over the years. I've, I said a dumb thing today on film, so it's okay. What? What's she saying? Scavenger? Yes, use your voice. Scavenger is one of them. Look, look at that, guys. The last two lines of this paragraph. It says there might have been a scavenger in the street. Half of it. Scavenger. What is a scavenger anyway? Uh, if we think about an animal that's scavenger. A rat. Because what do they do? They scavenge. What does that mean? They, they, eat, the 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 remains. they eat the remains or the scraps, the crumbs, the leftovers. Like how many of y'all have seen The Lion King? You saw that movie? Okay, good times, right? All right, so who, which of the animals eats first when there's a kill? Uh, the, the lion eats first, that's right. And then maybe some other animals. Who eats last? Right, the hyenas or the scavengers, right? Because they're just getting the very leftovers or scraps. Now look at those last two lines, and it says something about there might have been a scavenger in the street if miraculous presence. That means it would have been a miracle in the scavenger section of town. Why? Because oh, there's nothing, no food. there's no food for the scavengers to get. That's what we're talking about. Okay, that's that's pretty bad. There's other stuff. Hope. Oh, good job. Did you see mutilated earthenware? What a strange way to describe a broken cup or a broken plate. I certainly wouldn't say mutilated plate. What word, what do we use to describe things with the word mutilated? I think I heard it. What kind of bodies? Healthy bodies? Dead bodies, right? We think about Caesar whose body was mutilated, right? Butcher. So I'm trying to say mutilated is a very strong word, certainly much stronger than we would put with a cup, like a broken cup. Okay, what else? What else do we have? Hope. Didn't you give me the last one? Yeah, give me something else. Joy. Try. Did we get them all? Oh, okay. Well, what is it about? What kind of fragments, Nathan? Wine rotted fragments. Okay, so this is the piece or pieces of this wooden cask. What's going on with those pieces? 
What are the people doing with them? They're, licking them. They're licking them, and what else are they doing? Using them as a chewing on them. Right. Hang on a second. Hold that question because Nathan said with eager relish. I thought relish was like pickle relish on hot dogs. That's one kind of relish. But what's another kind of relish? If I am to, if I am eating a steak with relish and there's no pickle relish, what does that mean? Like, it's very it's the, right enjoyment, enthusiasm. So look at these poor people. When's who has ever chewed on sugar cane? Does anybody even know what I'm talking about? Sugar yes. cane. Okay, so you know that that's kind of pulpy, but it's got a soft texture to it. What about wood barrel cask? Like, would you do that? Would you put wood yes, in your mouth like a shingle and chew? No, that would be, you would be desperate to do that. And yet these people were desperate. Okay, what was your question, Amaya? The words that we go over in this class, do you want me to like fill them in? No, no, you're okay. All right, so look down there. Actually, it might be the Keep going. You're on, the, you're on the swing. You have a swing of whatever. Underline. <laughs> First presence. A shrill sound of laughter and of amused voices. Voices of men, women, and children resounded in the street while this wine game lasted. There was little roughness in the sport and much playfulness. There was a special companionship in it, an observable inclination on the part of everyone to join some other one which led, especially among the luckier or lighter hearted, to frolics of embraces, drinking of pelts, shaking of hands, and even joining of hands and dancing a dozen together. And the places where it had been most abundant were raked into a gridiron pattern by fingers. These demonstrations ceased as suddenly as they had broken out. The man who had left his saw sticking in the firewood he was cutting set it in motion again. The woman who had left on a doorstep the little pot of hot ashes at which she had been trying to soften the pain in her own starved fingers and toes, or in those of her child, returned to it. Men with bare arms, matted locks, and cadaverous faces, who had emerged into the winter light from cellars, moved away to descend again. And the groom gathered on the scene that appeared more natural to it than sunshine. Do we have lots of stuff? Israel, what do you notice in this paragraph? Give me something that suggests a tongue of menace. Faces. Good cadaverous faces because it's especially helpful if you know what a cadaver is. What is a cadaver? A dead, a dead, body. Body. A dead body, a corpse, right? A corpse, dead body, corpse. Okay, so when I take you after we read this book, night over here, and I take you in January or February to the Holocaust Museum. And you see all those dreadful pictures of people, live people with cadaverous faces. You're going to see them, you know, like they look like a skeleton with skin stretched over them. They're like, their, their cheeks are all sunk in and everything. Okay, that's not, that's not a pretty sight. What else besides cadaverous faces do we see? Well, fall. So hold on to that thought, Hannah. So it's soften the pain. Soften the pain in her own starved fingers. Starved fingers. Wow, starved fingers, toes. I would underline that. That's very good. And then soften the pain. That's a terrible. Would you want to live in this part of town? Of course you would not. Hope. What do you see? Okay, look at this. Underline gloom, but I'm only going to let you underline two to three words at a time. So between gloom and the period that ends that sentence, what should I underline? Gloom. Sunshine. More natural sunshine. than sunshine. Right. Gloom, more natural than sunshine. 
Okay, that's really sad. That's telling us that it is the order of the day for there to be depression and gloom in this place. And it would be like as unlikely as a snowy day in July in Huntsville as to have a happy, cheerful day in this part of town. Yes, did you find something else? What? Yes, let's talk about matted water locks. Hair. That's right. And these people's hair, it's all matted. That's more than we need to take a brush or comb out. That is like rat's nest tangled hair. And it's tangled mainly because of what? They can't shower. Like Filth, right. They can't, they can't, they don't have sanitation, so they can't get the dirt and grime and probably critters. Undoubtedly, there are vermin in their hair, right? Sure. Why are y'all not just sitting there? Haven't you ever had lice? Oh, no. Um, where y'all been? No. Okay. I'm just saying, there's all kinds of critters that can infest. Yes, Israel. Okay, that gridiron pattern. What that's meaning is the people don't even care if they're eating mud as long as they get the wine. So they're scraping the mud to scoop up the wine. Some are going this way. And some people are going that way, and so that's the pattern that it's talking about. But I want to, what? What about it? Thank you. I thought something was wrong with, like, on it. Okay, so I want to, remember Nathan a minute ago, I just want to point this out. There were some happy times in this paragraph. He said frolics and embrace. There was a little roughness in the sport. It was more playful. Right. Playful. Okay. So if I tell you that this whole paragraph is foreshadowing how these common, hungry, oppressed people are going to react when they start the revolution, do you understand that when it's time to kill people, and shed some blood, they are going to be happy about it. They're going to be dancing in the streets, even with their weapons, as they're killing people. Yeah, so I'm just saying, there's lots of violence. That's her thing. Yes, sorry. Dancing the yes, good. Sarah's pointed out shrill laughter, because shrill laughter is not happy laughter. That's like a witch's, like, Cackle. Yeah, I can't really do it. But anyway, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so don't dump the pork into like waste out in the street. Oh, yes. Just throw it out the window or. Oh, yes. It's just so nasty, nasty, nasty. All right. We better carry on. So if you continue to see things, the next paragraph or two, feel free to underline them, but I'm done. Okay, good job, guys. So, if you want to come along, Oh, who's that mouse? Oh. Oh. It stained many hands, too, and many faces, and many naked feet, oh, and see. many wooden shoes. Okay, would y'all. The hands of the man who's so Yeah. Would y'all circle St. Antoine in the second line of that paragraph? Circle St. Antoine, and then with your green pen in the margin, please write a suburb of Paris. A suburb of Paris. That's the ghetto of ghettos is where these people live. But I thought suburb, suburb yeah. like, 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 it's a community. It's not the same nice. yeah. 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 Some yeah. suburbs yeah. are nice. Some suburbs yeah. are yeah. ghettos. Yeah. This is definitely the ghetto suburb. Like ghetto ghetto Paris. Paris. Yeah, you but you've been you've been to like you've driven through some ghettos and big cities, right? Yes. Yes. Really, yes. really. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 All right, let's go. Yes. 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 And the forehead of the woman who nursed her baby was stained with the stain of the old rag she wound about her head. Those who had been greedy with the slaves of the cast had acquired a tigerish tigerish smear. And one tall joker, a service merchant, his head more out of a long squalid bag of a nightcap than in it, sprawled upon a wall with his finger dipped in muddy wine leaves. 
love. Okay. So if you saw the movie yesterday, raise your hand if you were the movie. Okay, because I think this scene was in the movie yeah. where the guy dips his finger into the wine and he scrawls like in graffiti fashion the word blood on the side of the on the side of the building. Why the word blood? Why not wine? There will be blood. Because there what? There will be blood. They want blood. blood. They want somebody else to pay with their blood for all of the misery they live in. Is yes. That like what you said about blood in the last time round? Yes. Oh, yes. Because and that's very good. And look at the next paragraph and go ahead and put a little green F for foreshadowing. And while you're stopped right by the word blood, can you write this fellow's name? Gaspard is his name. He's the guy that wrote the word blood. The blood. The time was to come when that wine too would be spilled on the street stones, and when the stain of it would be red upon many men. And now that the cloud settled on Saint Antoine, Red which a momentary dream had driven from his sacred countenance, the darkness of it was heavy. Cold, dirt, sickness, sickness ignorance, ignorance, and want were the lords in waiting on the saintly presence. Nobles of great power, all of them, but most especially the monks. Samples of a people, people that had undergone a terrible grinding, grinding, and grinding, and grinding, grinding in the mill. In the mill. And certainly not in the fabulous mill which ground old people young, shivered at every corner, passed in and out at every doorway, looked from every window, fluttered in every vestige of a garment that the wind shook. Okay, so when you saw the, okay, I want you to write in green, biggest problems. Before those five things that you underlined a while ago, cold, sickness, ignorance, all that, I want you to put biggest problems because these are the big problems that this area of Paris has to deal with. Cold, it's wintertime. None of these people have heat in their homes. They don't even have a coat. They don't even have so, windows. No, don't, don't help me, Nathan. I promise you, I know this book so well. And I really even know this time period probably better than you do. So please let me be the teacher and why don't you learn disease that is called by caused by filth. These are the problems that they have. But I want you to write in green. You'll have to squeeze it in above that word want. And if you were at the movie yesterday, you remember when that pitiful lady in the cemetery was asking that wealthy man she said so many people die of want what that means is hunger that's what you need to write every time people talk about dying of want they're talking about dying of starvation hunger and so i want you to write that word so you'll know okay sure. don't mill, sit up so you don't lose ten points the mill that grinds young people old. The children had ancient faces oh, and grey faces, ancient. and upon them, and upon the grown faces and ploughed into every furrow of age and coming up afresh was the sign, hunger. It was prevalent everywhere. Hunger was pushed out of the tall houses in the wretched clothing that hung on poles and lines. Hunger was patched into them with straw and rag and wood and paper. Hunger was repeated in every fragment of the small modicum of firewood that the man sawed off. Hunger stared down from the sweatless chimneys and yeah. started up from the filthy street that had no offal among its records of anything to eat. And on the baker's shelves, written in every small loaf of his scanty stock of bad bread. At the sausage shop, in every dead dog preparation that was offered for sale. Hunger rattled its dry bones among the roasting chestnuts in the turn cylinder. Hunger was shred into atomies in every farthing porringer of husky chips of potato, fried with some reluctant drops of oil. Its abiding place was, in all things, fitted to it. A narrow winding street full of offence and stench, with other narrow winding streets diverging, all peopled by rags and night and all smelling of rags and nightcaps, and all visible things with a brooding look upon them that looked human. 
in the hunted air of the people, there was yet some wild beast thought of the possibility of turning at bay. Depressed and slinking though they were, eyes of fire were not wanting among them, nor compressed lips white with what they suppressed, nor foreheads knitted into the likeness of the gallows rope they mused about enduring or inflicting. The trade sons, and they were almost as many as the shops, were all grim illustrations of want. The butcher and the pork man painted up only the leanest scrags of meat, the baker the coarsest of meagre loaves. The people rudely pictured as drinking in the wine shops croaked over their scanty measures of thin wine and beer and were gloweringly confidential together. Nothing was represented in a flourishing condition save tools and weapons. Underline save tools and weapons. We were just told with all the problems they have in this part of town, what is the one thing that's flourishing? Do you know what that word means? Flourishing? Thriving. What's that? That's really cool, isn't it? Well, yeah. foreshadowing lots of violence. They may not have food. That's what you should write at the top. They have no food, but they do have weapons. Weapons and weapons. But the cutlers, knives, and axes were sharp and bright. The smith's hammers were heavy, and the gunmaker's stock was murderous. The crippling stones of the pavement, with their many little reservoirs of mud and water, had no footways but broke off a black lift at the doors. The kennel to make amends ran down the middle of the street, when it ran at all, which was only after heavy rains, and then it ran by many eccentric fits into the houses. Across the streets, at wide intervals, one clumsy lamp was slung by a rope and pulley. At night, when the lamplighter had let these down and lighted and hoisted them again, a feeble grove of dim wicks swung in a sickly manner overhead, as if they were at sea. Indeed, they were at sea. For this last and the sentence. ship and crew were in peril of tempest. That's metaphor. For the time was to come when the gaunt scarecrows of that region should have watched the lamplighter in their idleness and hunger so long as to conceive the idea of improving on his method and hauling out men by those ropes and pulleys to flare upon the darkness of their condition. But the time was not come yet, and every wind that blew over France shook the rags of the scarecrows in vain, for the, the birds, birds find a find song, song in feather. No That's another metaphor there. And so you have two metaphors in that paragraph with your green pen Above skinny or gaunt scarecrows, please write down the people. And I would abbreviate PPL for the people. The gaunt scarecrows are the people. And the birds that have pretty feathers and they have pretty voices, they are the rich people, the aristocracy. So write that down there below birds. Find a feather and song. The wine shop was a corner shop, oh, better than most others in its appearance and degree. And the master of the wine shop had stood outside it in a yellow waistcoat and green breeches, looking on at the struggle for the lost wine. It's not my affair, said he, with a final shrug of the shoulders. The people from the market did it. Let them bring another. There, his eyes happening to catch the tall, tall joker, joker. Right his joke, he called to him across the way. Say then, my Gaspar, Gaspar, what do you do there? The fellow pointed to his joke with immense significance, as is often the way with his tribe. It missed its mark and completely failed, as is often the way with his tribe, too. Okay, so what's happening right here? Gaspar is the tall joker, and I'm happy you underlined that because on the test, it's actually not going to ask you something about what does Gaspar do. It asks you, what does the tall joker? And so it's really important that you know. I, I would draw a little red line from tall joker to Gaspar so that you would know. You really want to remember about Gaspar. Not only is he the guy that writes blood on the wall, but he's a tall joker. And so now the wine shopkeeper, who's going to be a really important character in this novel, 
he and his wife are the future leaders of the French Revolution. So we definitely want to pay attention to them. The wine shopkeeper comes up and he takes some mud and he erases or wipes out that word blood that was scrawled on the building because he doesn't want to attract attention from the authorities that people in that part of town are unhappy and dissatisfied with the government as it is. So that's what's going on right here. Yeah, but too. Well, now, he was subject for the mad hospital, said the wine shop keeper, Circle crossing wine the road shopkeeper. and obliterating the jest with a handful of mud, picked up for the purpose, and smeared over it. Why do you write in the public streets? Is there, tell me thou, is there no other place to write such words in? In his expostulation, he dropped his cleaner hand, perhaps accidentally, perhaps not, upon the joker's heart. The joker wrapped it with his own, took a nimble spring upward, and came down in a fantastic dancing attitude, with one of his stained shoes jerked off his foot in his hand and held out. A joker of an extremely, not to say wolfishly, practical character, he looked. Put it on, put it on, said the other. Call wine, wine, and finish there. With that advice, he wiped his soiled hand upon the joker's dress, such as it was, quite deliberately, as having dirtied the hand on his account, and then recrossed the road and entered the wine shop. This wine shop keeper was a bull necked, martial looking man, man of 30. and he should have been of a hot temperament, for although it was a bitter day, he wore no coat to carry one slung over his shoulder. His shirt sleeves were rolled up too, and his brown arms were bare to the elbows. Neither did he wear anything more on his head than his own crisply curling short, short dark, dark hair. hair. He was a dark man altogether, with good eyes and a good bold breadth between them. Good humoured looking on the whole, but implacable looking too. Evidently a man of a strong, strong resolution, resolution and a set, set purpose. purpose. A man not desirable to be met rushing down a narrow pass with a gulp on either side, or nothing would turn the man. Okay, so that's a description I would write with my green pen, description of Mr. Defarge. Now we're going to have a description of Mrs. Defarge, so you can circle Madame Defarge with your red pen. Madame Defarge, his wife, right, sat in the shop behind the counter as he came. Madame Defarge was a stout woman of about his own age, with a watchful, watchful eye that seldom eye. seemed to look at anything, a large hand heavily ringed, a, a steady, steady face, face, strong features, and great, great There was a character about Madame Defarge from which one might have predicated that she did, did not, not make, mistakes make mistakes against, against herself, herself in any of the reckonings over which she presided. Madame Defarge, being sensitive to cold, was wrapped in fur and had a quantity of bright shawl twined about her head, though not to the concealment of her large earrings. Her knitting was before her, but she had laid it down to pick her teeth with a toothpick. Thus engaged, with her right elbow supported by her left hand, Madame Defarge said nothing when her lord came in, but coughed just one, one grain of cough. This, in combination with the lifting of her darkly defined eyebrows over her toothpick by the breadth of the line, suggested to her husband that he would do well to look around the shop among the customers for any new customer who had dropped in while he stepped over the way. The wine shopkeeper accordingly rolled his eyes about until they rested upon an elderly gentleman and a young lady. Who was seated in a corner. Who's that? The 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 Homie G. Homie G. I couldn't remember her name. Oh, Lucy. 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 The 17-year-old girl. Okay. Yes. Other company were there. Two playing cards, two playing dominoes, three standing by the counter, lengthening out a short supply of wine. As he passed behind the counter, he took notice that the elderly gentleman said in a look to the young lady, This is our man. What the devil do you do in that galley there? said Monsieur Defarge to himself. I don't know you. But he feigned not to notice the two strangers and fell into discourse with the triumvirate of customers who were drinking at the counter. Okay, so while Mr. Defarge, the wine shop owner, 
is visiting with these three customers at the bar, I want you to figure out if you notice anything really odd about their conversation. Oh. I'll go to Jacques, said one of these three to Monsieur Defarge. Is all the spilt wine swallowed? Every drop, Jacques, answered Monsieur Defarge. When this interchange of Christian name, Christian was name means Madame name. Defarge, picking her teeth with a toothpick, coughed another grain cough, and raised her eyebrows by the breadth of another line. It is not often, said the second of the three, addressing Monsieur Defarge, that many of these miserable beasts know the taste of wine or of anything but black bread and death. Is it not so, Jacques? It is so, Jacques, Monsieur Defarge returned. At this second interchange of the Christian name, Madame Defarge, still using her toothpick with profound composure, coughed another grain of cough and raised her eyebrows by the breadth of another line. The last of the three now said his say as he put down his empty drinking vessel and smacked his lips. Ah, so much the worse. A bit of taste it is that such poor cattle always have in their mouths and hard lives they live, Jacques. Am I right, Jacques? You are right, Jacques, was the response of Monsieur Defarge. What? What the heck? What the heck? Everybody's name Jacques. And why she keep raising her eyebrows? They spilled it on purpose. They spilled it on purpose. She's definitely the watchdog in the location. And every time she coughs, she's she's basically saying, you "Need to be careful. You need to watch. Smart." They so they all really called Jacques, do you think? No, that's not Or could that be a code or something? No, it's not like bro. Oh. It's really a code or something. Like almost like bro. This third interchange of the Christian name was completed at the moment when Madame Dufarge put her two big bar, kept her eyebrows up, and slightly rustled in her seat. Oh, then. True, muttered her husband. Gentlemen, my wife. The three customers pulled off their hands to Madame Defarge with three flourishes. She acknowledged their homage by bending her head and giving them a quick look. Then she glanced in a casual manner around the wine shop, took up her knitting with great apparent calmness and repose of spirit, and became absorbed in it. Gentlemen, said her husband, who had kept his bright eye observantly upon her. Good day. Chamber furnished bachelor fashion that you wish to see and were inquiring for when I stepped out is on the fifth floor. The doorway of the staircase gives on the little courtyard close to the left here, pointing with his hand, near to the window of my establishment. But now that I remember, one of you has already been there and can show the way. Gentlemen, adieu. Okay, and we're fixing to see what's up there on the very top floor also in a tiny little attic. But right now, those three guys that were all called Jacques, Mr. Defarge is telling them, y'all go ahead and go up there to the top floor and peek in that little attic and see what's inside there. And now, Mr. Defarge is going to start talking to Mr. Lord. So good. They paid for their wine and left the place. Monsieur Defarge was studying his wife at her knitting when the elderly gentleman advanced from his corner and begged the favor of a word. Willingly, well, sir, said Monsieur Defarge, and quietly stepped with him to the door. Their conference was very short, but very decided. At the word, Monsieur Defarge started and became deeply attentive. It had not lasted a minute when he nodded and went out. The gentleman then beckoned to the young lady, and they too went out. Madame Defarge knitted with nimble fingers and steady eyebrows and saw nothing. Underline, saw nothing. And with your green pen, you need to write watchdog because every time it says she saw nothing for the rest of the book, that's really, we're supposed to know, oh my gosh, she didn't miss a teeny tiny detail of that. Wait till you find out what she's knitting. That's what makes her really in all of literature, the most notable villainous in all of literature, truly. And it's connected with the fates in mythology. Those of you who remember your mythology, the three sisters, 
one spins the thread of line, one measures the thread of line, and one cuts. So that she is very representative of the face. And so okay. <laughs> I love this book. Mr. Jarvis Lorraine and Miss Manette, emerging from the wine shop thus, joined Monsieur Defarge in the doorway to which he had directed his other company just before. It opened from a stinking little black courtyard and was the general public entrance to a great pile of houses inhabited by a great number of people. In the gloomy tile paved entry to the gloomy tile paved staircase, Monsieur Defarge bent down on one knee to the child of his old master and put her hand to his lips. You need to underline child of his old master, and you need to, with your green pen, right above child, squeeze in and write P period, which stands for page 26. Yes, and that, let's just stop and turn back to page 26 really quickly and look at the top and see what you've already underlined that I just wanted you to remember. Yes, and remember, Dr. Manette is staying at the home of his old servant in Paris. So when Dr. Manette was about, I don't know, early 30s uh, or maybe late 20s, he was already a very respected, famous physician. And Ernest Defarge at that time was like 14 years old, and he was paid to be a servant in Dr. Manette's house. So when, when Mr. Defarge sees right here Dr. Manette's beautiful daughter, it makes him so angry. That's what the rest of this paragraph is going to tell you. He gets so angry because he realizes anew, because the wreck of Dr. Manette is upstairs in the attic, and he has to be locked up because he's out of his mind. And so when he sees this beautiful daughter, that Dr. Manette has never even seen, much less raised. It makes him angry, angry, angry at the at the aristocrats who were responsible for all of that loss. Good. There his lips. It was a gentle action, but not at all gently done. A very remarkable transformation, transformation had come, had come over seconds. him. He had no good humor in his face, nor any openness of aspect. Had become a secret, secret angry, angry, dangerous, dangerous man. man. It is very high. It is little difficult. Better to begin slow. Thus, Monsieur Defarge, in a stern voice to Mr. Lawrence, as they Is he alone? The latter whispered. Who should be with him? Said the other, in the same low voice. Is he always alone then? Yes, of his own desire, of his own necessity. As he was when I first saw him after they found me and demanded to know if I would take him and that my peril be discreet. As he was then, so he is now. He is greatly changed. Changed. He says changed. The keeper of the wine shop stopped to strike the wall with his hand and mutter a tremendous curse. No direct answer could have been half so forcible. Mr. Lorry's spirits grew heavier and heavier as he and his two companions ascended higher and higher. Okay, and that is where we're going to stop. Why not stop? Because it's 323. Does that mean I can't come to my desk? Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, you want to finish this? No. Yes, you did. Did you send that? Oh, no. What? Okay, so you're, 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 you're one of my smartest people in here. Please read this book. I'm counting on you. To the end of the chat. Where is the bathroom?
Watch the movie yesterday. I thought you were here, so you'll come back Monday. And after you see the rest of it Monday, I think you'll really enjoy the book more. Because once you know the big picture, it's a lot easier to catch all these other little things. I'm glad you came yesterday.